Good morning, church. My name is Pagamani. I came from South Africa. I was raised um, in Zimbabwe by my mother and my stepfather. So I was raised by uh, a mother who was in a society that lacks knowledge. So the society that tells women that you need to do whatever it takes to save your marriage. So what my mother did was to do whatever it takes to save his marriage. So I went to stay with my mother in the marriage. So it was like it was not easy for her to bring this child in the marriage. So to protect his marriage, he took all the anger out of me that I even thought I grew up seriously thinking that my mother hates me. It's only when I was old when I realized that, no, she loved me. My mother would throw anything that is close to her. You know, anything that is close. I was not allowed to make a mistake as a child. So I was always conscious of what I'm doing. And doing that, I made a lot of mistakes. And those mistakes, they costed me a lot. My mother would pick up even a brick to hit me. And he always told me that he would die in my hands. So it was a very difficult, very, very difficult life that even my mother did it to protect her marriage. So in every, I was excluded. I was treated more like a maid than a child. So the other children who come there also to visit my uncle's children, my aunt's children, they will be treated like queens. I'll be the one saving them. So I worked hard to fit in the family. So I grew up thinking my mother hates me so much. My mother hates me so much. Even when I went to school, I look, now I, I never had father's love. I never, I never had mother's life. So I started looking for that love outside. And the devil took the opportunity of that. So I went to, I used to go to school. I would date at a very young age. And trust me, if you don't know God and you, do any, you are in a position whereby you do anything to find love, you do even bad things. There were times when I was even thinking of committing suicide because I couldn't take it anymore. There were times when I thought about, I was scared. I don't know what made me scared. I was even thinking of being a street kid some other time. Let me run away from this house and be a, but I was scared. I was also scared to be there, out there, doing nothing. And I think today it's God's protection. So God protected me. I was in early relationships, sexual relationship. So I looked for something that would take me away from that home. But I didn't want to go out like a, a crazy child. I wanted, you know, like at least marriage was going to take me out of home properly. Then I'm out. So I got involved in a relationship you know when you don't have love, a, 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 a girl who doesn't have love from the parents, from the family, even a boyfriend that gives me a banana is doing a lot. Just a banana, nothing. Just a piece of banana or a slab of chocolate that is too rant. It means a lot, so you get carried away. So I got involved in a relationship um, with the father of my child, the child that I have now. That man was married. Was married, was staying there, he came, he pampered me, and I fell for it. And not knowing in that state you attract men that are not even in good mental health themselves. You know so when I came to that relationship, I got pregnant. When I got pregnant, the family of the men, they were very supportive, knowing that maybe that other woman realized who she married. So she was distant. So when they got me, and me, I was somebody who was seeking, very wanted love. So I would do anything. You know, I would do anything I would, to make sure everyone is happy, that guy is happy and everything. So they helped me to take the burden out of them. I was a child. I was still young, 21. So to take a man who is far much older than me. So I took this man to Cape Town. We stayed there. He looked for a job. We worked. So it was like I'm raising a man. It drained me a lot. And it was not a healthy relationship. I got tired. There was a, we became fine for a certain time, but his things started. His demons started manifesting again. He started drinking, doing all sorts of things, going out, not coming, and it frustrated me a lot. And that's when I made Pastor Joyce. And I got the real um, Christ, Christianity. So when I met Pastor Joyce, she didn't know me. She just gave me a prophecy that may change my life. She said, God is saying, the man separated you for a reason. That man is not your husband. Mm -hmm. That man is not your that That day it was like a big rock was lifted from me and put down. I was so happy. I became so happy like a, like a baby. I was free. And then they even called me the family. They threatened me. Why I'm leaving him. You know, I got all the threats. But because of that word, I knew that God is on my side. Yeah. So they couldn't do anything. Yeah. 
So it was a very, very difficult. Even after that, because that I never had the father relationship, mother, you know, that parent relationship. So even relating with God was affected. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't know that a father protects, yes. a father provides, you know. Yes. So my relationship with God was affected. I couldn't trust God the way I was supposed to trust him. So I still believe in doing things myself. So I, it still got me into a lot of problems. And I think mom choice because she was patient. From that relationship, I went to another one. That was emotionally abusive. You understand? And these times, I, I remember I was even living in fornication for a long time. Eh? That one, I, it was so difficult to break Trust me, it was so difficult. But the other thing um, that delayed, I think that delayed everything, is that I didn't give myself fully to God. You understand? I still believe that if those days I gave my life fully to God, things were going to be different and in a faster way. So my relationship with God was so disturbed that I trusted. And you know, I grew up doing my own things. Even in those days when I was going to school, I had to do, go to this, make a saloon, do people's hair, to get money for grocery, to go to school. So I trusted too much on my abilities. Your own abilities. Yes, my own abilities instead of trusting God. Yes. So all this time, it got me into a lot of problems. I, it's just, trust me, it's just recent that I asked God, I said, please, Holy Spirit, help me understand the love that my father had for me. Because mm -hmm. I don't understand. And I believe that if I get that love, the, the understanding of how God loves me. I know my life will change. Mm. I even, I posted yesterday, taped to that, you must be a child. That's what I've been praying for. To me, it was a confirmation. Is that I want to be God. I want to be God's little girl to understand his life. If I understand his life, love, I will know that he's a provider. I won't get into debts because I will know that he's a provider. I'll trust him. I was like, God, I was even like, how did the three Hebrew brothers, this is the way Hebrews, mm. how did they trust God until they were put inside the fire? I was like, if it was me, I was going to, at the edge there of the fire, they said they are throwing me, I was going to change my mind. <laughs> you understand? So yeah. I said, I want to trust my father. I want to yes. be a baby, mm. you know, and trust him. So what I can say, the life of not uh, having parental love, it can um, affect, but if you faced with that situation, yes. know that we have a father. Yeah. We have a father who loves us more than parents. And stop seeking that love from boyfriends, from what? Because you go from bad to worse. Seek God with all your heart. He's our father. Yeah. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Why is it important at this day and age for the church to involve itself in such a conversation? Praise the Lord. Amen. The truth is, everybody standing is helped. Mm. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. And sometimes when we preach and we are very stern, yes. it's because we know the aspect of being deliberate. Mm. You know, so when my mom died, um, I, that was around 29, 2010, I was so discouraged. The reason is because my own case came from my disappointment in God. Because my mom was always given to prayers and she was always prophesying how that she would see her children and her children's children. And suddenly she was cut off. So my faith was attacked. Because I believe in what works. And if a woman prays like this, commits her whole life to you, I, I don't understood warfare, and she's cut off, then this thing may not be true. So I, I, I backed out on God. And the moment I turned my back on God, other demons came in quickly. So I became, I, I got given to alcohol. In Nigeria, there's, there's a drink we call star lager beer. So usually in the evenings, there is this test. If you don't take star, if you like, take a drum of, of water. You, you can't, but when you take a bottle of star, then you come alive. <laughs> <laughs> you come alive. So start lager beer, and then at some point, I started going clubbing. So we go to clubs, we dance, we have fun. I mean, that was the world, you know. And for one year, I went from heaven to hell. Everything collapsed, you know. This, I was a drunk, I was clubbing every Friday. The only thing I didn't do was smoking. But one day while I was in the club, I danced with a lady and I was to take her home. And then I heard a voice speak from the wall. The wages of sin is death. So fear hit my heart. <laughs> <laughs> because I was angry with God and I, I don't pretend over things. 
I abandoned everybody. I told them to get out with their religiosity. You know, so I fell headlong until God came for me. That word came. I started contemplating it, struggling. That was when God sent a pastor my way. And then he began to encourage me. You know, the love formula talked to me, took me back to church. And I thought, the way I turned the way I could turn back. That was when I discovered it was warfare. So every Friday, my body literally begins to itch me. Because it's like the club was pulling me. I was being pulled. I had to start taking fast, start taking prayer exercises. That was when I learned the way of solitude. So sometimes I'll go on 40 days fasting, go on 90 days fast, so that I could, I could deaden the flesh. Because it was so strong. If you don't go to this club, you want to die. When my friends had to relocate from the city, I literally felt lonely. I became so scared. Because my whole life was about clubbing and drinking. Clubbing and drinking. And God began to come in for me. God began to come in for me through love, through discipline. I was gradually restored mm. until the fire of God came back. So, I mean, wow. I've tested of, the, of both sides. Wow. Now, if you study church history carefully, you discover that the idea of penitentiaries, the idea of rehabilitation centers was born by the church. The government took it over eventually because the government became, you know, the, the authority that controlled human civilization. But that was originally the idea of the church because man, on the, the church understands the role it has to play in dealing with man. So when you are dealing with somebody who has a mental issue, you have to deal with that person from the three faculties of his being. The first place to deal with is the spirit. I can tell you that no matter how much love, how much compassion you show a man, if you don't deal with the demon, you are joking. You will show that person love, the person will discover he's a slave. Because, like he said, you have legally opened the gate and that spirit came to take legal possession. <laughs> so the first point of reference is spirit. Now, our approach in dealing with spirits are different. There are places you get to where spirits will have to be cast out. Probably because that's the instruction the Holy Ghost gave or because that's the leading of the Holy Ghost at the time <laughs> or that's their orientation towards it. So they've got to cast out demons. There are places you go to, they believe that the revelation of the world can bring deliverance from demons. So while they are teaching the word of the Lord, deliverances are taking place. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when we are teaching, people are slain under the anointing. When we are teaching, people, demons are crying out of people. There are places you go to, they generate so much atmosphere of God's presence that demons can no longer tolerate and demons leave. So whether we are casting out the demons or whether we are bringing revelation that brings deliverance or whether we create an atmosphere, primarily demons have to be cast out. Mm. When she met Dr. Joyce, she didn't tell us um, that demons were cast out, but there is an atmosphere the woman carries mm. that arrested her spirit. Yes. So there are places you get to the atmosphere deals with your spirit. Mm. When you deal with the demon, then you come to the second realm, which is the soulish realm. That's where you begin to apply the character of the spirit. You show love and you introduce disciplines to help the person. Mm. So the first thing the church does, which is the only entity that can do it, there is no other entity in the whole universe that can deal with demons. The hospital cannot deal with demons. The government cannot deal with demons. There is no entity in this world that can deal with demons. So you are asking, what role does the church have to play? How is the church relevant? The church is the only legal institution on earth that deals with spirits. So when people come with addictions, we have the authority and the power to address the spirits that cause those issues. Mm -hmm. And so when we deal with those, those issues from the spirit, then we also come to the soulish realm. Yes. Like they've earlier stated and clearly mentioned, there are, are, are different expressions. Number one, we have to understand what opened the gate in the first place. Dr. Borali said something. He said some people were rejected. So you see that somebody is rejected, that person needs love. Some people were molested. If somebody is molested, the person begins to deal with issues of insecurity, issues of low self-esteem. You have to go back to address those issues. Mm. And the only way to deal with those issues is for the liquid love of God to flow to that person. Mm. So the person would need to see that you, the, although he or she has gone through things, but God still values it. And the reason is because Jesus died for all of us. And so whether you are a fornicator, you are a murderer, whatever the case is, Jesus died for you. So you are worth the blood of Jesus. Mm. And if you are worth the blood of Jesus, then you are worth the love of God. So we love them the way they are. And by loving them, we love them into the presence of God. Mm -hmm. So when they come into the presence of God, they discover that the, the depravity of the soul that they try to make up for by looking for this addiction, there is much more in God. Mm -hmm. So when they embrace the love of God, their deliverance, soulish deliverance begins from there. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not enough. Because many times, because they are humans, you know, when you are dealing with the human system, you discover that there are, there are three different levels to your physical makeup. There is the flesh, which is the hardest part of you, which is what we see. Then there is the liquid aspect of you that contains every information about you. That's where you have the blood mm -hmm. and the fluids of the body. Mm -hmm. So if I want to check what's in your body, if I take your blood, I can read everything about your DNA. And then there is also the impulses, which are products of neurotransmitters. Mm -hmm. 
So man begins from a physical and visible aspect to an invincible aspect. The neurotransmitters and the energies that are released from man, they are like antennas. They are like the, the impulses that flow from an antenna. Demons contact them. So when we show people the love of God, we have to bring them to a point where we lock the gates that produces those energy and impulses that demons relate with. That's where we bring the disciplines of the spirit. So you've got to tell the person, like Pastor said, if you look out for naked pictures, you look out for pornographic pictures, and they activate energy, you've got to stop looking at those things because every time you activate those energies, you are a neurotransmitter. Demons also read those energies. So if you keep looking at those things, even though the love of God has come, those energies you generate will make those demons to come back to you. Because Jesus said in Matthew 12, 43, he said, when an evil spirit is gone out of a man, it will return. But if that man is empty and unkept, the spirit will come with several more wicked demons and worse will be the case of that man. So we don't just cast the demons out, we lock the gates. And so we bring the people to the love of God and then we bring the discipline of the spirit. So there are friends you need to cut off from. There are places you need to stop going to. There are gadgets you need to throw away. There are sites you need to stop visiting. So through mentorship and collaborative and synergistic support, we help them to build this discipline until eventually they stop these things. And as they stop opening those gates, something psychological will happen to them. Because the brain is already releasing neurons. But the reason the brain is releasing those neurons is because you are servicing it. Now when you stop looking at those sites, you stop interacting with those friends, you stop going to those places, you discover that you start fighting within. Yes. The reason is because neurological processes are going on. But through the discipline of the spirit and through the guidance you receive, this is apart from the love of God now. Over time, when the brain secretes those neurons yes. and there is no response, a point will come, that aspect of the brain will become dormant. Mm. So the secretion of neurons will stop because there's a biological aspect to it. Yes. That's where medical science comes in. Mm. For example, if you eat every day by 12, the moment is 12, neurons hungry. are secreted, yes. you become hungry. Yes. You are not hungry that time because you are hungry. You are not hungry that time because your body needs food. You are hungry that time because neurons are secreted. Mm -hmm. If you stop eating by 12 for one month, you will discover that when it's 12 o'clock, you will not be hungry again. Yes. The reason is because hunger is an alarm that you need to eat now. Mm. But if you stop eating at that time, that alarm will stop because there have not been any response in 12 months. There have not been any response in one month. Mm. And so when it stops, you will start eating at another time. That's what happens to addictions. That's what happens to mental issues. Yes. When the demons are cast out, the love of God is shown in man, the discipline of the spirit must mm. be brought so that secretions of hormones and neurons will have to stop. When these things stop, the demons will no longer have access to that person. Yes. And so the person begins to secrete new hormones. So the person who would at 12 o'clock want to watch pornography yes. because he has stayed around believers for a while he wants to pray at 12 mm. and then he discovers that new sets of appetites have been created so instead of demons the holy ghost comes in angels come in yes. and you discover that the person develops new appetite yeah. and his lifestyle changes Good. but it need you need education beyond the soul to be able to deal with these things yes. if you go to the hospital and you neglect the church for example the hospital gives you drugs what those drugs do is to deaden your hormones there is no cure for schizophrenia what they do is that they kill those secretors until those hormones are no longer secreted. Mm. But a point will come where the person can relapse mm. and secrete those things again, he comes back. Okay. That's why you have to keep taking the drug for a lifetime. Yes. Because they are actually not treating you, they are killing your nerves. Hey, now allow me to bring in the doctor here. This is now, <laughs> now this is where I want to find a balance. Yes, please. Do, do, do you agree with everything he just said? Totally, 100%. Oh, okay. If you, listen to this. If you stop, listen, yes. if you stop taking those drugs for three days, you become yeah. mad again. That's yes, true. So they didn't do anything to the madness. Yeah. They were just trying to shut down. They didn't know that they know you're an antenna. Mm. So they are trying to shut down the impulses you are generating. Yeah. So that's the best they can do for you. But what we do as a church is that, number one, we cast out the demons. Number two, we show you the love of God. Mm. And number three, we bring you spiritual discipline yes. that begins to secrete different hormones other than what is secreted. Yeah. You see that? So at the end of the day, at the end of the day, if we administer it correctly, something happens to you. What happens to you is that you begin to interact with different spirits. Yes. Spirits that will not subjugate your will, but spirits that will introduce you to the will of God and help you become a better mm -hmm. person. Good. Now, does this mean we should kick out medical science? No. Uh -huh. That's where we get it wrong. Yes. The reason is because there is a collaborative effort that exists between spirit, the spirit of God and science. They were inspired. We don't shut it down. Why is it so? You have 300 people. What I'm talking about here will require a very detailed attention. Yes. You have two pastors looking over 500 people. The pastor can't do it because the level of attention required is not there. If you want to talk to 10 people who are addicted, you may need to give them two years of your life. So while you come with the power of God, while you come with the love of God, you can't reach everybody. 
and it takes a faith level to walk in these things. Yes. So while you are dealing with the ones you can deal with, the other ones you cannot deal with who can receive medical help, they should keep receiving medical help mm. until they are able to receive the love of God. Mm. Do you know how many of Pakamani that are in South Africa? Mm. Dr. Joyce met one. There are a thousand people there. Mm -hmm. There are a hundred thousand people there. Mm -hmm. If they are all waiting to encounter Dr. Joyce, they will die before she meets them. Yes. So why Dr. Joyce is meeting the one she can meet? Medical science is helping those they can help oh, okay. until they are able to encounter God. Mm -hmm. Do you see that? I can assure you that in Kenya today, there are over one million people that have malaria. Mm -hmm. How many evangelists are in Kenya? <laughs> How many people are ministering healing in yes. Kenya? If you say they shouldn't take malaria drugs, they yes. will die. Why we are dealing with the ones we are dealing with and we are encouraging them to build their faith and we are ministering to them, the ones that are not yet reached, we will need to allow them to take drugs until they are, they are able to meet God. Mm -hmm. Because if we begin to preach and tell people, don't take drugs, a lot of people will die before they encounter God mm -hmm. and we will be responsible for what happens. Did you read the scripture? When Jesus cleanses the leper, he tells the leper to go and see the physician. Because Jesus is not against the physicians. Mm -hmm. But what we let people know is that there is something better than medicine. So while you are yet to access God, Keep accessing medicine, but keep building your faith. Mm. Because healing is not all God has to offer. There is something called divine health. Mm. So while you are accessing healing through medical science, there is more. So we will not stop you from medical science, but we will tell you that while you are taking advantage of medical science, you should know that there is a power in God that can make you walk in divine health. Mm -hmm. Because there is a realm where people don't fall sick. Good. There is a realm. Yes. But we know that not everybody is there. Everybody is growing. We are at mm. different level. Yeah. Pastor once upon a time was addicted to pornography. Today he is a healer by mm -hmm. the spirit. Mm -hmm. What if you told him that he didn't need the discipline he needed then? He won't be using the discipline now Good. because now he knows the life of God. Okay. He knows the power of God. He knows the presence of God. But he was not always like this. Mm. But before he got here, he needed to apply what he was applying. So like Martin Luther Martin would say, Luther. if you cannot fly, run. If you, can't if you cannot run, walk. If you cannot walk, crawl. Yeah. But by all means, get there. Yeah. So I would love to maybe take two questions uh, from you guys. Just two, please. Just two. So that we don't interfere with the next session, right? Right, so there's a gentleman in um, yellow, yellow, yes. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Yes, my name is uh, Wanja Levant. I'm born again for the past uh, two years, and when I listened to Pastor T's testimony, it put me so much because I've struggled with the pornography and masturbation for the last 12 years, that's from 2010. But I can always preach to young people. I've been preaching for the past two years. I can preach wonderful sermons. I can pray even for us. I do fasting every now and then. People entrust me with their secrets. And they come to me, they tell me, Evans, I struggle with masturbation. And I tell them the best things how to pray. I preach to them. But the moment I preach to them, when I go back to my room, the same demon follows me. But I have the word in me. I can still preach to people. And they can change. And they even come to me that everyone's helped me to, to get out of masturbation. But I myself, I'm still struggling in the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I meet young men, we pray with a group of us, around 10 people. We go for prayer and fasting on a mountain for three days. But after that fasting, when I come back home, I encounter the same thing. It is that I always pray amiss or it beats that I always repent before God every now and then because the other day, I was listening to Apostle Michael Ropo's message about repentance that people go to church, you cry, you cry before the Lord, you cry, you cry. That repentance is not about tears, but it's about uh, making a decision. Mm -hmm. I always make decisions to, to come out of it. I cannot watch pornography for two weeks, but now when it comes to the third week, I feel there's something I'm missing. Mm -hmm. Then I find myself Wait. going back okay. to the same thing. Okay, good. So what? I don't, I don't understand my problem because I have every information and I understand that the wage of sin is death. But I still just do it. Mm. I don't understand that thing because many people are suffering the same thing, the people I lead and minister to. Yes. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Uh, so, um, the lady in purple and uh, the gentleman in maroon. So let's just start with the lady in purple. My question goes to the apostle. Um, I really desire more of God. I, w I ask, um, how does the fire of God come? And uh, at what point? Because um, um, I know we are born again. And the things that we read in the scripture don't match the reality in many believers' lives. And I know there is more than that. Uh, there is more because the God in the Bible, the God who acted during the times in the book of the apostle, is the same God we serve. And yet today we can see people come to church and then they leave when they are sick. That pains me because the Bible is 
the God who heals the sick, God, the God who delivers, the God who makes people walk from the wheelchair. How come we don't see those manifestations in our time? And I feel we cannot live as if something is not wrong. We cannot live assuming that all is well when we know the reality and the, and the Bible don't match. So my question is, how can we make the fire of God come upon our lives and for it to become a reality? Thank you Thank so you. much. The gentleman in Maroon, please. Uh, praise God. Amen. My name is Benny Hill. Hi, Benny. I'm very fine. How are you? I'm very fine. Yes. Uh, I honor all the great men standing there. My mentor, Pastor T. Pastor T is the guy who led me to Christ in Form 2 after I had been suspended in seven schools. Yes. And I also honor my role model, Pastor Burale. And Michael Oropo, uh, there is a day I listened to your sermon in the morning. I was going to preach in high school and I canceled that meeting uh, because I thought I needed to pray again. <laughs> So, and I actually even have a gift for you. This is a copy of my book I said I'll give you when you come in Kenya. <laughs> so, my question is, uh, because at school I'm the president of something called mental health, and my dream is to become the president of Kenya someday. <laughs> so, my question is, there is a time I was in Form 2 and we had gone with Pastor T to preach. I used to take him to high school missions. And that same day, I was in a relationship and the girl was pregnant. And that day we had planned to go for the abortion. Then Pastor T was preaching about life and destinies. So he preached a very powerful sermon. And we had to cancel the abortion. So now, I went and told the girl, you know what, let the child come. So the child is there right now. I've been preaching in high schools. Now the question is, I've never used this example. This is the first time I'm saying this. So the child is there. I take care of her alongside my mom. Now the question is, if I go back to high schools and I'm preaching, should I use this example? Because I feel like I'll be attacked. Because in this country, if you use scripture, people say it's a very powerful sermon. But sometimes I go in school and then God is asking me, why don't you use this example? So now my question is, which is the right time to know when to use your scars? Mm. I go to the house of Robert Burale. He keeps on telling me, Benny, use your scars. I went to Lynn Gugi. She interviewed me on her channel. I wanted to say that story. Sorry. But I felt it is not the right time because I wasn't sure. I Allow me. I interviewed this gentleman how many months ago? Six. Six, ma six months ago. And for some reason, I've been unable to release his episode to the public. That's the confirmation. It is because I felt there was a part in this man's story that my audience really needed. So I'm not going to answer. Maybe I'm not saying this is the time for you to use your scars, but I'm looking forward to doing now another interview where now we get to... You, you, you get to Yes. So, oh, sorry, sorry, Benny. He, he keeps on telling me, Benny, use your, use scars. your scars. But I ask myself, I go in schools and I, I preach. People say this young man has written books and all that. But I'm not sure. I, the only person who knows that story is Pastor T. I'm not sure when is the right time that I should say this story. Yes. Because I see the way my mentor is always attacked on social media. They tell him about the strip club and all these things. I've never even also told him that story. I was to tell him three days ago. Yes. Then we can say that meeting. <laughs> So I'm not sure when is the right time that I should use this story. I say a lot of scripture, then God is like, I want you to say this story. Yes. But I'm not sure. So when is the time that I should now say this out? Yes. Because when I was in this meeting, I felt now this is the right time for me also to step out. Because people know about books. People know about a young man who wants to be president. But there is the other side. I was born on the same day Benny Hill came to Kenya. I'm not even sure if I should be a pastor or a politician. I'm not sure. I'm in between. Because when I go to preach, I feel fulfilled. But there is a part of me that asks, which is the right time? So that's thank the you. question I have. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, thank you, Lynn. I, yes. Now I know I'm loved of God. Eh? He'll yes. always see. <laughs> so thank you. Um, I have like two questions. Um, I had uh, written them down. Uh, one is, uh, maybe to our pastor, Pastor T here, we love you. How do my people, the church, heal broken people from church and from the world? Do we Christians understand, we who are especially born in church, and us who came in and grew and we became stronger, how do we understand the struggle of the people of the world? Because the reason why we judge is because we think, because we have been graced, and we are strong, now I have the audacity to judge the other person. So do, how do we bring ourselves to understanding their struggle without necessarily having to go to the strip club and understand the struggle? Because I think that's why we judge a lot. We mm. don't understand the, the, the struggle there is. My second question is, firstborn mental status. Uh, maybe you can share some wisdom 
on the balance because I am one of them and uh, they, it can get overwhelming and you don't know when to start and where to stop and where to draw the line and the expectations thereof. And the final one I had shared with the Apostle is um, about uh, dreaming, dreams and the mental health. Is there a relationship? Uh, is it normal for people, for someone to dream serially? As in, anytime you close your eyes, there has to be a dream. You remember it, you see it, um, the as spiritual aspects of it, and does God speak through dreams? And what does it make for dreams interpretation? How do you unlock those dreams? How do you pray? Because sometimes I pray and I used to ask, you know, wonder like, why God don't you want me to understand this thing? So how do you pray for you to be able to get that wisdom that helps with understanding of the complicated dreams? Lovely. Thank you so much. Pastor T, I think there are two questions for you from the audience. Yes. Okay, let me first of all address the person I mentor. Yes. Benihin Aska is a healed wound. So the moment the wound heals, it leaves a mark as a scar. So never share your wounds, but you can always share your scars. Aww. So, if anyone was to attack me for being, having suffered pornographic addiction, I look at them and smile and say the grace of God took me out. But if I was still a victim or just came out and I'm figuring it out, it will mess me up. Uh, I'll just answer the last question. I'm just attempting around the questions now. The man that says he preaches God's men and when he goes back home, he's like the demons are following him. I was given wisdom. When you minister, you empty yourself. There is, by the way, you become more vulnerable after the pulpit. Mm -hmm. Many people ask Noah, he never fell before the floods. It was after the flood that he manufactured the first alcohol. Because before the flood, he, there was an anticipation. But after the floods, there was an emptiness. And many times after powerful moves of God, you know, the ministry is about us being spent. And that's why you must have a system of recovery. You don't go to watch Netflix after the Holy Ghost has fallen. This is what I do. Anytime I go to a meeting and I sense the move of God, immediately after that meeting, I must put on my earphones and begin to charge the spirit man because my level gauge has gone down. And at that level, your flesh is very much alive. Many preachers don't fall before revival. They fall after the anointing has moved and they leave that place vulnerable. And the wisdom will be in the future when you get married and you're invited for a two-week revival meeting, carry your wife. <laughs> she will help. Otherwise, sir. Thank you. I think, uh, Pastor T, you've touched um, on pretty much everything, but uh, I want to, uh, uh, Dr. Burari, if there's anything you would want to add before... Let, let, let me talk to Benny. <laughs> I know you were supposed to be in my house three days ago and you didn't meet, so you've said that's when you're going to tell me. Now, remember, we talk about Jesus, but it's the scars of the cross that carry the power. Now, don't be scared because people hit me. If one person meets me and tells me, because of your strip of addiction and your deliverance, I'm still standing in Christ, that one voice will make me handle a hundred haters. You've got to understand that. But even the people who will attack you, it's because they're expressing their own frustrations. Some have access to free Wi-Fi, so they can attack you. But even in their attacks, in their secret place, your scars that carry God's power will minister to them. They may never come back to tell you it is your story that changed them, but God knows that. So don't wait for tomorrow. I'm glad you have said it here today. Wear your scars, and, and your spiritual fathers told you it is a healed wound. So nobody can make it gush out blood again. Wear it with wisdom. All right? Not to glorify. I don't glorify strip clubs. I have been hit because I lost my marriage. I don't glorify divorce. I actually think marriage is the best thing since sliced bread. You understand? But you use those scars to show that God can still get you out. One of the preachers I listened to, Dr. Jamal Bryan, says, I am in the pulpit because I've been pulled out of a pit. Mm -hmm. And remember, there are other people who are in form one you got a kid in form two whose parents don't even know there's a child out there mm -hmm. but you can tell them if you can confide in your spiritual father or somebody as a mentor they will guide you and then one day you'll stand on a podium and say you know what this is what i did but i'm preaching the gospel by the amazing grace of god mm -hmm. so your scars one with wisdom and with the help of god will actually be your place of power do you know there are people who have paid for my flight to go and talk about the mistakes I did for my marriage to end. So it is that mistake that took me somewhere 
many, many 15, 16 hours away to speak about it and to bring deliverance. So wear it with, us, with, with confidence. And when they attack you, Mr. T and I are here. We shall give you some shock absorbers. When you want to cry, come and cry in our office. Yes. But when you get out there, go with the boldness of the land of the tribe of Judah. Amen. Wow. Allow me. Oh, I love. Oh, wow. I love how everyone is smiling. I'm Kinja. So, <laughs> you're not as hungry. So, uh, Apostle, close this discussion for us. Thank you so much. Um, I, I think I need to say something to the brother again. <laughs> Maybe because he said he wants to be president. Yes. <laughs> so we need to make sure we do a thorough work. Um, there's something you need to realize. In this kingdom, only God makes men. God can use men. God can use circumstances. But only God makes men. Many times, we want to appear in a certain way before the people. Because we think we will grow and be relevant only with their approval. This is why many people become fake. This is why many people become false. They want to paint a picture that is acceptable to the people. They don't know that by doing that, they shut away the operations of God that should reach out to the people. Like Dr. Borali said, sometimes the greatest power you see flow out of your scars. As you share those stories, the people you would never have been able to affect with all the anointing you feel on your head are affected when they can relate with what you've gone through. So when you go out, don't try to appear like a superstar. You didn't come to show yourself. You came to reveal Jesus. Many times we are put under pressure because we want to come to a place and make people perceive us in a certain way. And if you are not careful, that will ensnare you. You are someone picked from the gutters. So it is in God picking you that he showcases his excellency. So don't hide where God took you from. You should be proud of where God took you from and you should be happy about where God is taking you. He said he lifts the beggar from the donkey and make him to stand among princes to inherit thrones. When you come to the thrones, don't act as if you were born there. Let the people know God took you from the pit. Because it's not the applause of men that make you fulfill destiny. Jesus fulfilled destiny on the cross. You can be crucified and while being crucified, you're fulfilling destiny. So please, as much as it's within your power, try to deliver yourself from men. Don't be moved about what they say. Be moved about what God is saying through you else you would limit God. Yes. Men can ridicule you, but in ridiculing you, you fulfill destiny and God will bless you. Mm. Alright? Yes. So please, discern the Holy Spirit and feel free to allow God use you the way he wants to. Okay. And you will see the glory of God in your life like you've never seen before. Good. One of the messages that God used to blow up what we're doing was the first time I shared about my club experience, about my alcoholism. Suddenly people were amazed. We thought this guy was a superman. So he's also as weak as we are. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, they took their eyes off me and they began to look for the God that helped me. Good. And that way they started having deliverances. Mm -hmm. So please, don't bother about trying to be what people say you are or to be what people perceive you to be. Just show them Jesus. Yes. And sometimes you show them Jesus through the things he's carried you through. Mm -hmm. um, the brother talked about um, making decisions. So making decisions to come out of addictions is not just to say, no, I won't do it anymore. There is a follow-up that is required. When you've made up your mind, the reason that decision is important is because the Holy Spirit is not a demon. Demons override your will. But the Holy Spirit respects your will. So before the Holy Ghost can help you, you've got to make the decision that you don't want this anymore. You want the best of God. Good. Now, having made that decision, there are many other decisions you need to make. The next decision you need to make is to submit your weaknesses to the Lord. The problem people have most of the time is they want to prove themselves to God. So they want to let God know they won't do this again. They want to show God that they will not do this again. In their heart, their simple heart, they are trying to make God happy. But I can assure you that before the coming of Jesus, for 1,500 years, the people of Israel tried to prove themselves to God and none was found righteous. So quit proving yourself to the Lord. When you come to God, show him your helplessness. Show him your fears. Show him how many times you have fallen. Show him how helpless you feel before this thing. And then ask him to help you. When you come to the Lord and you want to let him know you will conquer this thing because you want to make him happy, you will be in trouble. He knows you and he knows what you're going through. The Bible said he is also stricken with the feelings of our infirmities. So when you come to the Lord, you've got to tell the Lord you're afraid. You've got to tell the Lord you're helpless. You've got to tell the Lord you're not sure this will work. As you open yourself up to the Lord, then he will fill you up. So the second thing you must master to do is to surrender 
to the Holy Spirit. It's when you surrender to the Holy Spirit that he begins to give you the strategies that are peculiar to you. That is where your deliverance comes from. As you tell the Lord your fears and how helpless you are, he may tell you, take a 21 days fast. That 21 days fast, the level of power that will be released, you would never have sensed it before and it will break you out. Now, if you go to somebody else who is suffering from masturbation and you tell him the cure to masturbation is 21 days fast, you'll be shocked. He will do 21 days fast and become stronger in masturbation. <laughs> because the power is not in 21 days fast. The power is in the fact that you surrender to the Lord and the Lord prescribed a strategy to deliver you. It's like medical diagnosis. Somebody can have pains on the head. That pain can be stress. Paracetamol handles it. Somebody else can have pain on the head. That pain can be a growth. It will take a CT scan and it will take, you know, operation to, to cut off that growth. So it's not just about the pain. It's about the diagnosis. It's about the, the treatment that follows. You went to the Lord. You surrendered to the Lord. He prescribed a fast. Another person will have to make that decision and also go to surrender to the Lord in truth and in genuineness. And God may tell that person, worship me for seven days. God may tell that person, like God's servant said, pray in tongues. You know, he said he came to him by revelation, pray in tongues for one hour, for one month. And the, the, the thing breaks. So you've got to learn to surrender to God. Show God your helplessness. God. Don't come and show God you are a superstar. When we come out, we can boast to devils that we can do all things. But when we come to God, we fall before him in brokenness. He's the one that prescribes what we must do. And it's in doing it that we are delivered. Mm. So you will leave this place and you go to the Lord and ask him to help you. You would, you would surrender before him. He would give you a strategy. And that strategy will deliver you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. My sister spoke about receiving the fire of God and sustaining the fire of God. They are two different things. My friend will say, if you set yourself on fire, it's called suicide. If somebody sets you on fire, it's called murder. But if God sets you, sets you on fire, it's called revival. So it's God that sets men on fire. But many times God uses many channels. So you come for a meeting, he leads you to a meeting. And sometimes while the man is speaking, the word of the Lord comes to you. That word can set you on fire. Sometimes while the worship is going on, the presence of the Lord can fall upon you and it sets you on fire. So when you want to be set on fire, two things you must do is, number one, always make sure you are around God's presence. Because something from God's presence will set you on fire. It can be the word of the Lord, it can be the presence of God, it can be anything. And then number two, you must always focus and stay discerning. Don't come for a meeting and say it's when the apostle comes that something will happen. No, your fire may come during the worship. Your fire can even come while they are taking the announcement. And the scripture the person uses to take the announcement will set you on fire. So people are not set on fire because they are hardly around God's presence and when they are around God's presence, they are distracted. Mm. So they cannot catch what comes for them. It's called Catalambano. You catch it. So many times people are not on fire because they can't catch it. They despise God's presence. They despise people. You may be waiting for the apostle to minister to you in this conference. But maybe why Dr. Joyce comes up to introduce, that's when you are set on fire. Mm. Somebody may just have been set on fire by what Pastor T have said. And that's the conference for you. It's not even about the apostle. The apostle will come and go. It will not affect you. It may be what Dr. Burali said. It may be what Sister Bakamani said. It may be what Sister Joyce said. Something but from God. So stay in God's presence and stay discerning. That's what sets you on fire. Yes. Now, how do you sustain God's fire? That's a different question. Receiving God's fire is your openness to stay in his presence and to be sensitive. Mm -hmm. But sustaining God's fire is the labor of priesthood. In Leviticus chapter 6 verse 12, it said the fire on the altar must not be put out. The priest must put wood on it every morning. You want to keep the fire of God you must dig into the word of God every day. Yes. Because that word carries life. You want to keep the fire of God, you must have a deliberate prayer structure that you follow. Because when you stop praying, the fire of God goes out. Mm. And you will not wait until God tells you. You've got to develop a spiritual culture because that fire is sustained by that culture. And this is what I advise people to do. When the fire of God comes upon your life, you will notice a routine is activated. Some people, the fire of God comes on their life, they find themselves praying every morning. So what you will do to keep that fire is not just to wait for the stirring. Make morning prayer your lifestyle. Because that's what the fire brought. Mm -hmm. Some people when the fire of God is quickening in their life, they notice they start fasting. Fasting becomes natural. So what you do is that make fasting your lifestyle. Because fasting came with that fire. What will sustain the fire will usually come with the fire. Some people, the fire of God comes upon their life. They find themselves beginning to worship God more. So what you need to do is create a playlist. And every day make sure you worship God. As you keep doing what came with the fire, the fire will remain. Wow. But if you neglect what came with the fire, the fire will go down. That's the labor of priesthood. Yeah. So you want to sustain God's fire, you must develop that culture. Wow. It will keep the fire burning and you'll discover that you will go from strength to strength because you keep appearing mm. before the Lord. Good. My sister said something about dreams 
having dreams. Is it possible to have dreams consistently and continuously? Yes. Because the operation of God in our lives is in varying intensities. So you, you've got to, to, to have a grip on it by culturing it and by developing it. For example, you can have two prophets. There are certain prophets that prophesy under an atmosphere. When the atmosphere is charged, their eyes open. There are certain other prophets that have been trained to nurture their gift so well that a point comes any time they want to prophesy. They know how to switch it and they begin to prophesy. My friend, Chari, Prophet Chari, I'll give him a session in the evening and you see the forensic dimension of the prophetic. You know, he, just, he can just activate it and he begins to work in it because he's developed it. So is it possible to always flow? Yes. And the reason is because God is a perpetual continuum. We are the ones that tap into God and tap out. He's an eternal flow. And if you know how to connect to God, it happens all the time. It comes to some people as a gift, but certain people train themselves to walk in it. So is it possible to dream consistently? Yes, it's possible. But there is something you need to know about dreams. What you need to know about dreams is that you don't have a control over it. So if you find yourself a dreamer, you need to always build a discipline to keep your spirit pure. Because in that subconscious state when you are open, if you have not cultured yourself to walk righteously, you become vulnerable. Mm. Because demons can also access that frequency. The same way God accesses that frequency. So if you find yourself a dreamer, then you must ensure that you culture yourself in the way of righteousness. Because what happens to you is that your antenna is open. So number one, you've got to culture yourself in the way of righteousness so that you are open only to the Holy Spirit. And number two, you need to submit to a mentor who will teach you how to control and regulate that operation of God in your life. Because if you don't know how to control it, a point will come, that anointing can even kill you. That anointing can overwhelm your spirit. That anointing can overwhelm your mind. Mm -hmm. And then you find yourself sometimes cons consistently having headaches. You find yourself consistently having nervous breakdown. Because you, you can't keep the anointing all the time. That's why you need mentorship. So I'd advise you to look for someone that understands spiritual things to begin to mentor you, to control and to regulate it so that you can make the most out of it. So for everyone who is here, you may not have had the opportunity to speak, but you know that one or two things that somebody has said have affected you. Not one single answer here is enough. Everything we have said is an aggregated answer to deal with whatever it is you are looking for or whatever it is that you need. So thank you for listening. God bless you. Amen. Thank you for watching. And if this video has blessed you, please like, kindly subscribe, and also tap on the notification bell so you can stay notified and updated on our new videos. And please do not forget to share the link to people so we can bless more people. And most importantly, we want to know how this video has blessed you under the comment section. Don't forget to subscribe.